Welcome to Style Masterclass, the podcast that teaches women to look stylish and feel confident so that they can show up ready to conquer and slay no matter what size they are. I'm your host, Miss J. You ready? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Style Masterclass Podcast. This is another one of our really special episodes in our ongoing series, Shit My Mama Said. Today's podcast, I have a really cool guest for you. Her name's Amanda Kingsley. We were in the Advanced Certification for Feminist Coaching together, and she just has such a gentle coaching presence, y'all. And I'm just so excited for you to get to chat with her, get to meet her, and for us to find out shit her mama said and how that has transformed over time. So Amanda, feel free to jump in and introduce yourself to the audience. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yay for us, Advanced Certification in Feminist Coaching. So fun. Just like you said, I'm Amanda Kingsley. I'm a very proud life coach. I work pretty specifically, I do do some general life coaching, but I work pretty specifically with people in their reproductive well-being and very specifically after abortion. And so what does that look like? What are all the complex thoughts and feelings and identity shifts that happen after we make life choices like that? I am an author and a podcaster. I am a mother of three. I am married to my high school sweetheart. Oh, me too. I love that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that about you either. (laughs) How long have you been married? We have been married 18 years and we have been together 25, 26. Like, oh my God, I love that. Crazy. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's such a rarity these days to find someone who's, I mean, we're, we're actually really young y'all, but we're like old married ladies compared to sort of modern timelines of, of Ooh. marriage. Um, we've been married 14 years. It'll be 15 years in April. And we have been together since November 27th, 2003. So whatever the math yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. So almost yeah. 19 years, which is crazy, right? I, yeah. I remember the biggest, okay, now we're on a different podcast topic, but yeah. it's fun, right? We go where I it remember, takes us. <laughs> I remember the mark where I was like, oh, we've been together longer than we haven't been together. Like for us, that was, you know, crossing that 18 years of life together. And it was like, Oh, like this is the this is the big leagues now. <laughs> yeah, we know more years together than we know apart. <laughs> no, I, I totally understand. My husband and I met when we were fourteen years old. Well, oh. we dated. We didn't date in high school. Yeah. We were really, really good friends, and we clearly had huge crushes on each other. It was we we're such nerds. Like the things, like let, like give me five, and he, I would give him five, and then he'd like hold on to my hand, and we just stare at each other. <laughs> I mean, like so nerdy, right? But when we hit twenty eight, we realize I now I'm entering a place where I'm going to know you longer than I haven't mm-hmm. known you, which was mm-hmm. really cool. I really yeah, cool. yeah. I just remember that point being like, oh, we just crossed a new bridge here. So. Yeah, I feel like shit just got real. Dun dun dun. Right? There's no pre- <laughs> There's no pretending it's not real anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. Seriously. And I feel like if you've met someone in puberty and like watched them, at least from from my perspective, I've watched my husband from like when he didn't quite fit into his ears yet and he was really 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 skinny like he's actually become like a man like it's weird to like just see like okay this kid I fell in love with who's like this gangly little creature is now like a dude with a beard and like yeah silver foxing with his gray hair streak I'm just like who are you what is happening (laughs) I'm into this though (laughs) it's good I'm totally into it I you know yeah we don't, we can't talk about this all day, but we, <laughs> we totally could. Okay. But let's, uh, and just for anyone who, I, I think it's kind of nice sometimes to hear this other side of coaches that you admire and that you love. It's like, yeah, we're humans too. And we've have relationships outside of our coaching relationships. So I think it's good to chat about these things it's sometimes. Fun. Yeah. Super fun. So you are on the podcast today to talk about shit your mama said. So yeah, tell us, if there's something that stands out to you about Yeah, you. I have like a pivotal moment that I have come back to in many coaching sessions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're in that coaching session and you land there, you're like, oh, we're here again. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, you get into that broad place. You're like, oh, and all roads lead back to this moment. <laughs> yeah, it was a pip like, so I wouldn't qualify it under the category of advice, but like, I remember this moment. So it was so pivotal for me when I was probably 10-ish. And just like you, I live in pretty rural area. So it's like 45 minutes to an hour to get to the mall. Um, So you didn't just shop at the mall. Like the mall was a big deal. And I remember my getting dressed to go to the mall. And I was so excited because it happened like once a year. And my mom was like, those are not mall clothes. And it was just this moment where I was like, oh, there's like clothes for certain places. Like there's mall clothes. What does that mean? Does that mean like my clothes aren't good enough for the mall? Or does that mean like mall people are different than regular people? Like it was just this like, oh, clothes have like meaning beyond just what you get dressed and put on or what was in the hand-me-down bag that you got from your cousin. (laughs) Like (laughs) what's happening here and how am I supposed to know what mall clothes and what if I pick the wrong ones? Oh my God. I love that you said this because (laughs) like there's some version of this that every woman I talked to has. So for you, it was the mall clothes. I've had some clients who it's like play clothes versus work clothes, even when they're they're in their sixties and there's still that dichotomy of play clothes, work clothes, Um, clothes I'm allowed to do chores and clothes I'm allowed to run errands in. These are company clothes for when company comes over. Like we, we all have these you know, funny categories that were given to us somewhere along the way. So when you were younger and you heard mall clothes, what did you end up defining mall clothes as? Like, how were you able to differentiate? Yeah. I mean, well, I learned very quickly that day that they they were not clothes with holes or stains or ripped or like we had to look presentable. We had to look like we fit in. I think that that's probably the big key right there is like, we need to fit in wherever we're going. Like we can't look like we're outsiders. We can't look like we don't belong, which is kind of the story of my life. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, cause like trying to fit in, trying to fit in. Right. Yeah. So as you got older, how did that, you know, the mall people close, (laughs) like how did that translate for you as you got older? Yeah, it just like keep understanding and categorizing and compartmentalizing. And I do remember also in high school really wrapping my head around this. I'm going to say the word truth, but it's not really a truth. It just felt like my truth. And for a lot of people, it is, I think, like look good, feel good, do good. Mm -hmm. And I would wear like my favorite outfits on test day. I would like, if it was an important day, I got presentable. And there was some truth to that. Like, and there still is when I actually choose things that feel good on my body and feel like they fit the scene where I'm going. And to some degree, it does feel better to fit in. But I don't never questioned that until now. Like, like, why does it feel better to get it in? What am I thinking now? Like, why do I think this sweater makes me more of a coach than my, whatever, my, my hoodie? <laughs> so I think over the years, it just was always this like scanning for how I was supposed to look in certain places and how that would make me more acceptable to certain people. And the scanning is such an important thing to pause on because yeah. this also is something I hear frequently. Um, if, you know, my clients are all women. So typically the scanning takes place, something like scanning the room for the fattest person in the room to see if you are yeah. the fattest person in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, scanning the person in the room to see who's the most beautiful, to see who's, you know, the pimple free, you know, some iteration of this along the way, or who has the best handbag, who has the best shoes, who's standing the tallest, who has the most people around her. Like, and I I don't think there's anything wrong with it, right? Just kind of like you have this sense that dressing better helped you feel better. Like there's something about it that feels so true. Just like scanning the room feels like an important thing to do. And yeah, I think for 
our you know primitive ancestors scanning our environment was a good thing, y'all. Right? Like, right? <laughs> you mean her like heuristics? There, we our brains are wired this way for a reason. Like, thank God we scan the room and our environment to keep ourselves safe. But a room full of women at a cocktail party or at a conference, like. They don't have that kind of existential threat that maybe lions, tigers, and bears had. And our brain doesn't really know this yet. So the scanning part, I think, is such a powerful thing to just notice when you're doing it, friends. Yeah. And like, don't beat yourself up for it. Like, it's part of the way you're wired. But then really to stop and like, what are you scanning for? Which I guess is my question to you. What did you notice you were scanning for when you were scanning? Yeah, when you said that, I was like, well, how did that keep showing up in my life? If I think about it, like going to middle school, right? Like when you live in rural towns, it's like K through six and then six through 12 or seven through 12. Like there's two schools. It's not like (laughs) a whole bunch of schools. Showing up to new spaces, scanning, and deciding before you even know people, like where you're going to, where, where you'll be accepted. Like those people are really well-dressed and have all the fancy name brand stuff. Like I'm not like them. I won't fit there. And so I'm going to gravitate to these. And meanwhile, like you have no idea who any of these people are, what they're, what they do for fun, what they, what their belief systems are. You're just kind of like, using that external radar, I don't, I don't know what the word is, to decide where you belong when it, what's on your body really has nothing to do with who you are. So I think, I think I, I still do this. Like I still just walk in a room and kind of identify who am I allowed to talk to? Like who am I allowed to fit in with? Who might accept me because we look alike? so sketchy. Like when you say it out loud, you're like, oh, this is so sketchy. (laughs) I wish this wasn't my truth. (laughs) Yeah. Like in the words of my nephew who's six, that's sus. That's so Uh, sus. But we uh, we all do it, right? Like I do it, you do it, we do it. And I think, you know, if you part of a marginalized group, you especially do. I have so many instances of talking to women of color who walk into a room and try and find the other women of color in the room. Um, If you have, you know, if you're in a place where, and I remember doing this when I lived in London, looking for the other Americans in the room. And not because I felt unsafe around Londoners. I mean, my goodness, we all technically speak this language. But I remember that's how my one of my best friends in the world, Emily, and I met. I had a bright pink coat on. She had a bright red coat on. And all the Londoners were wearing black and gray. And it was very clear who the Americans in the room were. (laughs) And it was just like, you have a red coat. I have a pink coat. Clearly, we're meant to be friends for forever. And it's done. So it's not a bad thing always, y'all. But I... Go mm, ahead. Go ahead. I just love the way you said, not because I felt unsafe around Londoners. I think that's a really important distinction. Like, it's not that I feel unsafe around people who look different than me, dress different than me, appear to have a different class status than me. It's that I just, I feel more safe with people who I understand, like who, who I feel like get me. But I, I think that's really important thing to notice. Like, And that helps me remember that it's not a bad thing. It's not like I'm looking at people and going like, oh, they're terrible or, or, you know, they're dangerous or they're this or they're that. It's like, it's not that I feel unsafe. I just feel more safe with people who are wearing the hoodie or the sneakers or whatever. Um, Oh, I love, no, I love that you pause there. That's interesting. Yeah. I I love that you pause there because I think, you know, we all have the basic human need of wanting to belong. And really the scanning of the room is just, where do I belong? Yeah. Yeah. So good. I think I have like, just the way you said it, I was like, oh, I've judged myself for that. Like you shouldn't do that. It's going to look like you think, you know, whatever, like it's going to look like you think those people are bad or unsafe or whatever. It's like, no, it's not about that at all. Like, that's not the scanning. (laughs) That's not what's happening. (laughs) Yeah, that's not what's happening. Like, it's normal. It's human. We all do it. And we're all driven to find a place where we belong. Like, welcome, fellow human. 
Yeah. Welcome. It's not a judging for exclusion. It's like a judging for like comfort. Ah, uh, nailed it yeah. right there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, fashion. So, yeah. Fashion <laughs> style, right? Who knew? <laughs> we started out talking about mall clothes and here's where we land because yeah. this is all interconnected, right? It's all sort of gets enmeshed together in ways that we can't even foresee. So, you know, we talked about as you got older and like teenagehood, how it kind of translated. So, you know, when, when did you find coaching and, you know, thought work? I found network marketing first. <laughs> the thing I, that was a, the first thing I swore I'd never do before my abortion was <laughs> network marketing. And then you always land in the places you think you'll never land. But what I learned and I loved my company it was a medicinal mushroom company, like Chinese medicine. I love, I actually really enjoyed the business model. Like there were a lot of things I loved about it. But what I loved most was this version of coaching. And so I learned through that model that as a leader in network marketing, what I loved most was inspiring people, showing them what was possible, helping them break through their fears. Like that just lit me up. And eventually the story for a long time was like, why would I charge people for coaching when they can just join an awesome company and make money and get free coaching? <laughs> but that was before I really understood the depth of coaching. And in some degree, that was true. It served me in a lot of great ways, but I just eventually was like, oh, you're just a coach. Like that, you know, that's, that's the direction this was meant to lead you. So that was when I started I kind of hit like a bit of a rock bottom and a friend of mine who actually is a current client and has been for many years said to me, you got to listen to this podcast called the life coach school. I know you want to give up on everything, but just go back to the first five episodes and don't decide anything until after you've listened to the first five. And in my rock bottom, I listened to her and, you know, I was 15 minutes in and I was completely hooked and I did not go into coaching thinking I would coach after abortion. That all clicked and came together much later, like after certification. I went into coaching because I knew it was the way to help people change their lives. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So with your coach brain and your new coaching tools, how do you see the sort of dichotomy of the mall clothes <laughs> versus regular clothes. And I guess even just like noticing that you even like got that from somewhere. Like how does that translate for you today with the coaching tools that you have now? Well, I'm not sure I'm exactly going to answer your question, but this is, this is partly an answer. And something that struck me as I was talking was when I found myself with three kids married to my high school sweetheart, totally happy, done family. I thought I had an IUD in place that fell out. I didn't know. And when I found myself with an unplanned pregnancy, I was so utterly confused because I didn't look like someone who had an abortion. And it swings back to this idea of like how we categorize. Like I didn't, I didn't necessarily know who looked like someone who had an abortion, but I was so confused because I didn't, it didn't make sense. Like everything I'd learned about categorizing people suddenly didn't make sense. And more than any other experience in my life, going through that myself and now helping coach people through it, it's such a great opportunity to just like break down walls and really get to what's underneath people and life and being human and shed all the stereotypes about people who carry certain handbags or use certain birth control. Or I just truly believe that like the work I do with the clients I do, it gets to like the rawest, most real stuff. And if I scan back, that was what confused me most about choosing abortion in the first place was I don't look like someone who does this. I remember sitting in a parking lot Googling, like, do other moms have abortions? Like, I should have known, <laughs> should have. 
but I didn't because I was so used to categorizing people by like things that didn't really mean anything about them that I was utterly confused. So that's just really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I to, think I love realize that, you, that. Yeah, that you brought it to like, I like I categorize other people this way. And then I like, I think this is so common, right? We categorize other people as like, you know, people who do X, Y, or Z or don't do X, Y, or Z. And the people who do X look like this and people who do Y look like this. And we all have some version of this, y'all. Yeah. All of us. It's like right? people who eat kale don't get cancer. <laughs> uh, actually, they do, right? <laughs> like, with, there's, there's so many examples of it. And when you're that person who's been eating the kale diet and you get cancer, like, you got to face that shit. Like, oh, those those stereotypes were wrong. <laughs> yeah, or like people who wear a size four always feel confident. Or well, happier. Or happier, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, not not really. Yes. <laughs> They're also have, having a human experience. Yeah. People yeah. who wear designer clothes are more confident than people who wear hoodies. Like, yeah, it's just this this willingness to break it all down and go, what is actually true here? Yeah. So let's talk about breaking it down. Cause I think this is like, I think the beautiful thing about this series is being able to talk about things like here's some shit I learned and here's some shit I unlearned. And I think an important part of these discussions is like, how did we unlearn it? Right. So like if we were to, if we could, and if you're willing, and if this makes sense, you know, sort of three, four, five steps, if you will, to breaking all of it down and rethinking the categorizing. Like, what would you say that would be like? First, just laying out like what you believe, what you, what you're thinking already, right? In our world, like thought download it. (laughs) What's actually happening here? And then breaking down, like, is that true? Why do I think that's true? Do I still want to believe that's true? Like, you know, in my, we'll go back to the kale example, right? Like, I believe people who eat kale don't get cancer. Like, do I still want to believe that even though I have this evidence that it's not true? So what do I believe? Is it true? Why do I believe it's true? And do I still want to believe that? And who could I be if I let myself change that truth? Like in my situation, it's like, what kind of mother would I be if I let myself believe that sometimes mothers choose abortion? Like what would be possible if I let myself change this rule that I thought was just a rule that had to be followed? (laughs) Like... Yeah. No, so, and I and it's yeah. interesting, right? Like and really dear listener who are, however you fall in terms of your belief about abortions and the right or wrong of it, we're not here to debate that with you. So if anyone's thinking about sending me an email, please don't. We love you so much. <laughs> But really, like, all of us have categories. And I think Amanda's work is so beautiful because it blows our concept of what we think about women and what they're allowed and not to do, especially when they're mothers. And all of you are carrying around some version of this. Like, what are you allowed to do or not allowed to do when you're a mother or CEO or business owner or a daughter or a cousin or a niece or a wife or a spouse or a partner? Like, what have you been telling yourself because you have this particular role that you play? And I think this just gets to the heart of the matter for so many women, whatever those categories look like for you. So I just, I love our conversation, Amanda. This is so good. Mm, Me too. Yeah. And I just think it's so fun to play with like, what, who could I be? What could happen if I, if I let myself believe in the possibility of something else? I don't have to, like, I don't have to go there. There's no pressure, but what if I did? Like, what could be possible if I, like, and, and back to fashion, like, I'm not a person who wears heels. I don't do heels. Like, but what if I just like, let myself be a person who bought some heels? Like, <laughs> whoa, what if I changed that identity and just played with it? And we can do that about things like heels or things like reproductive well-being or things like our careers. Like, just let yourself, like, let the walls go and just be playful and trust that you'll land somewhere. You can always come back to your original belief. Like 
I can come back to the belief that I'm not allowed to go to the mall with a stain on my shirt or ripped jeans. Well, now ripped jeans are cool, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a pair. In fact, <laughs> I can let myself go back to that belief if I want to, but who am I without it? Yeah. Oh, such a good question. Such a good question. And you're, I love that. I get so many times. I'm not, I'm not a makeup girl. What is, what is a makeup girl? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, women who like wear full face, I'm like, well, who said you had to, where did that come from? You know, or I'm not a woman who wears dresses or I'm not a woman who wears pants. Like I, right. There's always some version of this. Um, I'm not a hat wearer. I don't have a hat head. I'm like, what's a hat head? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Where do, where do we get these categories? All right. right. Like my mall clothes, my play clothes. But I think you gave us a great framework for, you know, parsing that out and making decisions. Like, is this something I want to continue to believe? And the beautiful thing is, and you reserve the right to change your mind. You can always go back to original belief. Yeah. This one really messes people up in my, in my niche though, (laughs) because they can't go back. (laughs) But that's a whole nother conversation you can listen to my podcast for. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Okay. That's like, I think a beautiful (laughs) segue. Yeah. For the, for the things that perhaps there's no undoing, we'll just say. (laughs) But I mean, Uh, the, the ultimate coach answer answer is like, we're always looking for a feeling and we can still achieve that feeling even though we've made a decision that's irreversible, right? Like maybe in the fashion world, it's like, I tat- is this even a thing? Like I tattooed eyebrows or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I mean, there's right? plenty like, of cosmetic procedures. That yeah, like I did through. that because I wanted a feeling and I can't go back on that decision. Maybe I had bypass surgery or whatever, spent my life savings on a wardrobe, designer wardrobe. I don't know. The point is even, even the decisions that feel irreversible are not like you can still find your peace and your joy. You really can kind of recorrect and redirect every decision you make. Yeah. I love that. And I think, you know, so true. If like any of you are listening, who have had, you know, breast augmentation or even a breast reduction. This is something I hear, or, you know, you've had a mommy tuck or a tummy tuck and maybe your belly button didn't go back where you thought it should be. Your nipple placement isn't where you think it should be. Any number of things like there's, there's a way forward in terms of how you want to think and feel about this. And I just hope that this conversation today and maybe heading to Amanda's podcast to listen to other stories of hope that you some there's a way to find grace for yourself and there's a way through my friends there's always a way mm-hmm. through hey talk top secret i named my abortion baby grace <laughs> oh you just said that there's a way to find grace yeah yep. oh so good that made me want to cry actually that's <laughs> y'all mm-hmm. yeah yeah so good Thank you. Oh, so this conversation fun. was amazing. So before we tell the peeps where to find you, tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. Um, if there's something really cool that you want to point people to, tell us. I did things. publish my first book um, at the end yes. of 2021. That is very exciting. It is a book of a hundred love notes to help you survive, come alive and thrive after abortion. The most beautiful thing about the book is you can just slip that word abortion out and apply it to anything in your life. (laughs) So I even use my own book to this day if I'm struggling with like a parenting question or a pandemic question (laughs) or a career question. I just open the book up and find myself some inspiration. So that's very exciting. Um, Congratulations. I know I the book thing is such a funny funny thing to create and put out in the world. And yeah, I, (laughs) I just congratulate you and I honor you for completing that feat. Like so good. It took a long time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm super proud of it though. I love it. And, um, I think that's one of the best places these days to get to know my brain and how it works and if it can be useful to you in any way. So good. Okay. So tell us where we can find you, listen to you, engage with you some more. My podcast is called Speaking Light Into Abortion. Everywhere else, I am Amanda Starr, like S-T-A-R is actually my given middle name. 
a little bit hippie parents, hence the living in the woods being a big deal to go to the mall. Love it. <laughs> love it. And I love how the hippie parents also had rules about the mall clothes. That's yeah. so fun to think about. <laughs> so Amanda Starr Kingsley everywhere. Instagram website, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, I always tell people they can just Google Amanda abortion. They're definitely going to find something there too, because there's not many of us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so That's good. All right. Me. And we've got you, of course, everyone listening. We'll put everything in the show notes for you. Go show Amanda some love. And Amanda, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This was such thank an you. amazing conversation. And for now, everyone, we are out. Thank you for listening to today's episode. To learn more about how to work with me, go to judithgatan.com. Click on the Start Here button to get access to my free personal style class. I give you a quick style win, a confidence boost, and you walk away with the tools to start getting stylish. Who doesn't love that? See you there. Miss J out.